Hello. Um, this is Dan Cooper. Welcome to a Return on Character podcast where we interview people who make me better as human beings. And Emmanuel is one of those uh, human beings that I've had the privilege of knowing. But I want to start by, and I'm going to pitch it over to him and let him introduce me, but I'm going to give you a little bit of a tease. For those of you that are not able to see this on video, uh, Emmanuel uh, has lived in a tent for most of his career. He is a, technically a prince of some nation. He's been shot. He uh, has a small an army under his command and a fleet of planes. And his in in the things that he cares most about are things like uh, gorillas and mountain gorillas. Uh, and he's dedicated his life to them. Uh, with that, uh, as a teaser for this guy, uh, I can only say that um, this gentleman that uh, that I'm going to share with everybody uh, is one of my most favorite people in the world. Um, he puts uh, me to shame as far as his uh, commitment to selfless service in the world to try to make the world a better place. I know no one like him. Um, and honestly, uh, he's one of only two friends that I call up and I hope he's still alive every day. Um, <laughs> and that's how, that's how dedicated this guy is and what he's doing. Now with that, I'm going to ask Emmanuel, Emmanuel, would you please introduce yourself with your title and what you're doing and where you're at currently as we make this recording. And I want to just thank you so much for making the time to come and talk to me. And I hope I don't embarrass you too bad. Well, thanks. Thanks, Dan. Um, it's difficult. Well, it's difficult for me not to speak to you without a fixed a grin on my face, um, without a smile. Um, but um, in introducing myself, so um, my name's Emmanuel. Um, I... I've been um, incredibly fortunate um, in terms of the work that I've been able to do in my life um, in having been appointed as a national park director for one of the most extraordinary national parks in the world, which is uh, Virunga National Park, which is right at, at the heart of the African continent um, and in one of the most probably the most um, valuable place on earth in terms of the natural environment, which is um, this region um, in, in the, um, on the watershed between the, the Congo and the, and the Nile rivers, um, where um, the landscape splits these two extraordinary rivers at, right at the heart of Africa, um, and which has... Um, some of the most amazing mountains, lakes, wetlands, um, active volcanoes, um, and then this incredible um, biological life, which is, um, you know, this this enormous diversity of amazing African species. Um, the most famous of, of which, of course, is um, is the the mountain gorilla, um, but also the, you know amazing savanna species and and including the elephants, the hippos, the buffaloes, and so on. Um, and so I live in an amazing, um, in an amazing place. And that's really, I suppose, what, what defines me. Um, but it's not just, um, the natural, um, wonders of Virunga. It's also, um, the incredible challenges and, you know, the fact that we live in an amazing community of people, um, I think some of the most amazing people on earth in terms of what they um, you know, what they're faced with and what they overcome. Um, and of course, you know, that, 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 um, you know, has been subjected to such a, a, a difficult history, um, where the heart of the great lakes region of Africa, which has seen, um, terrible, um, suffering, you know, from the genocide in Rwanda through to these t horrific civil wars um in in congo um and um almost all of which you know began in 
in or around this amazing national park, which is Virunga. So um, my life really has been one of incredible contrasts um, between living in you know, the most extraordinarily beautiful, um, fragile place on earth, um, but also a, a place which has seen some of the most horrific events um, in, in human history. Um, and so, um, that, that's really how, um, you know, we've, you know, myself and, and an amazing team that I work with of, of Congolese and, and other professionals who've tried to, to manage the situation, um, for the past few decades, well, really. I mean, normally I have people on that manage a business or are CEOs. Um, and they're in the Western world and they deal with life challenges, you know, here. And, um, but my focus is always on individuals that I think have persisted through difficulty as a, uh, as what I think is also a, a more interesting story, but it's also something that we can all kind of benefit from from hearing, and I know no other person that lives in persistent dif difficult difficulty than say you and your team uh, of rangers that are constantly out there uh, putting their lives on the line uh, to try to push back the darkness. Um, just by way of background for everybody, I've visited Emmanuel several times uh, in Virunga National Park. I've had the great privilege of um, uh, flying with him, uh, it, it, around the park, um, uh, seeing the gorillas, uh, seeing everything he's built, uh, the hydroelectric dam, uh, the power grid, the businesses, uh, I mean, the list of accomplishments that have been uh, made by, uh, the Varenga National Park team is extraordinary. And, um, it, it's so impressive, but. What I want to kind of do is, if it's okay with you, Randall, I want to kind of back up a little bit. Is how does a guy like you end up in Africa? Because technically, I know that this isn't something you wear on your sleeve in any way, but you are a prince from Belgium. Can you give us a little bit, can you explain that? How does that happen? What is, how does that fit into your story? as it relates to your parents and, and your origins back to Belgium? Um, well, how I ended up in, in Africa was really my, my mother's doing, cause I was, I was born here. Um, my, my parents decided to move here many years ago. Why, why did um, they decide to move? And, why did they um, want to move to Africa? They, um, oh, I think, I think they were, um, like so many people, um, 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 enchanted by, um, the, you know, uh -huh. the extraordinary culture, the extraordinary natural world that, you know, the African continent represents, it draws you in. Um, and I think that's a sentiment that many, many people who come from abroad, um, feel, of course, it's so much more than that, um, than that early sentiment and you, you quickly realize it. Um, when, when you spend time here, but, um, you know, I think there are, you know, there are certainly romantic reasons why people want to come to Africa. Um, and that's certainly what, probably what drew them in, but they were, you know, they were, um, both in the social sciences and they, um, worked in the universities in North Africa. And then, um, my, my parents, um, joined the United Nations, um, and, and worked there for, for many years, they were probably much more stable in terms of, um, uh, moving to East Africa and staying there for 25 years in, in Kenya. Um, and that really gave me the, the opportunity to, you know, develop an attachment, um, that never wavered as far as, um, you know, wanting to spend my life, um, yeah. in, in, in this world, which is. Um, in Eastern remember, and Central Africa. Um, a moment in Kenya that kind of defined the trajectory of your life more towards 
the sciences and, and uh, wild animals and the preservation of that? Um, probably being sent to boarding school in, in Europe, you know, and when you discover what, huh. when something's taken away from you, yeah. you value it so much more. Um, so that was, that was a tough moment and, and really brought home how much I, um, I really wanted to, um, remain in, in, in East Africa. Um, but there were thousands of moments like that. Um, you know, I had a family that. Um, I think very genuinely loved being in, in Africa. And so, um, that enabled me to discover so much And each one of those moments spent, um, in, you know, mainly in Kenya as a child, um, getting, you know, to know the people of Kenya and, and the extraordinary places all adds up to, um, thousands of experiences that, um, the, the tie you to, um, to, yeah, to this you, region. Um, so we don't need to spend a lot of time on it, but th what, how is it that you're technically a prince? Was your dad a prince? Was your mom a prince? How was that, how was that lineage passed down to you? Um, well, they were both born of princely families. Um, so, um, they, they both, um, held, um, you know, those European titles, um, in, in the case of, um, um, the title that I inherited, um, they, um, it relates to, um, a princely family that goes back into the early middle ages, um, and is, um, was established in, in, in Germany, what was then the Holy Roman empire, um. And, um, was tied to a, a region of what is now Germany, which was a, a principality called Marode. Um, and, but subsequently, um, the family got drawn into, um, what would have been the, the Spanish Netherlands and was subsequently a province of the Netherlands. Um, and it was, um, some ancestors of mine that were really responsible for the rebellion, um, that saw, um, the creation of the kingdom of, of, of Belgium. Um, and so in recognition of that, um, all their ancestors were, um, 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 afforded the title of, of, of princes. Um, and, and so that's why I was, I was born with, with that title. Um, it's nothing I've done to particularly deserve it. It's to do with people who lived a, a very long time ago and who certainly did extraordinary things. Um, but it's not in, uh, in their it's time. Not traditional in the sense that we're kind of in the heat of all uh, things monarchy with passion yeah. of the queen. Um, but you don't show up in Belgium and you don't get a crown put on your head or anything like that. It has no, it's just a title. It's, not, it's there's no associated, uh, benefits other than that. No, that's right. It's, it's not, um, it doesn't, um, offer you any, um, yeah. specific privilege. Um, yeah. it's, it's simply so, a title. Manuel, could you bring us back and tell me about the time when you first went to Congo? Um, I've heard the story, but. For the viewers, it'd be great to hear. What inspired you to go? Like, um, when, when was the well, first time you showed up there? Um, I, I arrived in Congo in '93, um, and um, it, I arrived as a somebody who would recently finished their their studies. Who, you know, certainly was just starting in life. Didn't didn't know very much, but really was. Um, I was very, very attracted to, um, this, this country in particular, um, because of its extraordinary wildlife, um, and it's extraordinarily, um, wild places, um, that you couldn't find, I don't think anywhere else on earth. Um, and, and so that's, that's really what, what brought me to Congo. I was working for the national park service. Um, I managed to, um, to get a job doing that. Um, but in, I mean, in all honesty, I think it was, it was really the people of Congo that, um, made me want to stay here. Um, 
um, the, you know, the conditions were sometimes difficult. Um, it was very isolated. Um, when I first came to Congo, there was no internet, there was no, um, telephone, there was no, in, um, there wasn't, you couldn't even really write a letter because it would take right. three to four months to, to reach its destination. So by the time you got the response, it was really, um, old news. Um, and so you, um, you lived your entire life with the people who were around you, who turned out to be, um, just amazing people. Um, um, living in incredibly remote, can, difficult can conditions. You, um, can you, can you and, recall a story of any early individuals or families that, that kind of inspired or just kind of goes, wow, that that's that gave you the impression that the Congolese people were special. I mean, yeah, I mean the, um, the first ranger that I started working with in Garamba was called, um, Atama. Um, he was a young ranger. He had trained as a school teacher, um, and had qualified and was working as a school teacher. And then, um, the opportunity to work as a ranger came up and that, that he decided was what he really wanted to do. And when I first started working with him, I was, um, you know, a rookie, um, much as he was, and we, we learned, um, the trade of working in a national park together. Um, he taught me an awful lot. Um, and then, you know, our lives followed close parallel, um, close, um, parallel lines. And we ended up going together, um, to Virunga National Park a few years later and, and really did much of the early work together. Um, and I think from him, I learned, you know, a lot of, the uh, commitment that it takes to do, to do this work. Um, and just also the, you know, the, the, the craft of, of working in, um, in, um, isolated wild places, um, where you don't have access to all the things you've grown up to, to, um, and, and, you know, have, yeah. have gotten used to, um, he, um, you know, he was, he was also a very, um, courageous person. He, he didn't think twice about, you know, fulfilling his responsibilities as, you know, as a ranger, as a law enforcement officer, um, in the face of, um, very, um, violent, sometimes very violent situations. And it eventually caught up with him. Um, and he was, um, set upon by militias, by, um, armed, um, um, militia groups in, um, in Eastern Congo, um, and was, was shot in the back and eventually died. Um, and so he, he's somebody who always stays with me. Um, I think as somebody who's had enormous influence on, um, you know, what the way I, I look at the work and the life, um, here in Congo, it, it's, um, you know, it's something you, you commit to. Um, and you look at those who've made far greater commitments as a way of, of, you know, feeling very motivated about it. What, what year did you take over or be, assume the position of the director of the Maroonga National Park, Renu? Um, so I, I, um, I came to Virunga in, in 2000, um, but was appointed as, um, part director in, in 2008, um, and that was really, um, you know, the, the, the summit <laughs> of, um, of what I could achieve, um, in terms of, um, you know, the, the work I could do. So, you know, I was, I was 38 when, I, um, when I was appointed director of Rungo and that was it. That was, you know, that, that's where I wanted to be. There was nothing greater than that, um, on, on this planet to, to in terms of the, the job that I can do. And I've, I've been doing that ever since. When you took over that position, I mean, it was technically, if I'm right, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong here, was it one of your first leadership roles that you've ever assumed in the sense that you're leading an organization for the first time? 
Um, it was a leadership role that um, surpassed by, you know, a, a vast margin any right. other job I'd ever done. Um, and it was, it was incredibly um, daunting um, in the first days and months. And it remains actually very daunting. You know, I, I don't feel um, like I, I'm in full control of all right. my responsibilities at the moment. Um, even after, you know, the, the, the 14 years that, that, that I've been doing this work. Um, but, um, um, Did you have a mentor yeah, or anything I mean, it, it early was, on that you could call on? Cause it would seem to me that it would be a rather lonely position. Uh, you know, the isolation, the newness of the job, uh, the incredible difficulty of the circumstances was or did you kind of have to figure it out on your own? Um, no, I, I've always had amazing people to help me. Um, I mean, it, in truth, yeah, it has its moments um, where you feel um, you feel um, alone. Um, the those are really to do with um, you know uncertainty and um, you know the you know, occasionally lacking the, the confidence, um, to feel sure about yeah. your decisions, especially when those decisions have devastating consequences for, for others. Um, and that, that does leave you feeling very, very uncertain and, um, um, yeah, it, it's, it's hard. Um, but I've had all the support I could possibly hope for, um, from others and, and certainly would, would never have been able to, um, hold out on my own without it. Um, and, you know, I think that's, you know, that's what shaped it is, um, you know, the, the extraordinary human quality of the people I've been able to work with. Um, and they're, you know, they're amazing values, um, the, have been um, a real um, um, gu guidance for for me in in you know, the decisions you, you you have to make every day. There's there's a lot to to kind of understand, especially when you use the word values. You know, and um, and and I've I've often you know my orientation is. We define character as having four factors, uh, integrity, responsibility, forgiveness, and compassion as the things that are kind of markers universally for, for individuals who, who seem to have a, a higher degree of character tend to, tend to have those four characteristics. Would you say that that's consistent with your experience in Congo, um, with some of the individuals that you've gotten to work with? over the years? Yes, I think so. I mean, of all of them, you know, the one that I would, um, wish to be associated with is compassion. Um, um, I think, you know, that that's really, um, what, what, what one needs the most of, um, particularly in, in, um, in, in, in an environment like this, um, the rest um is is out of necessity um but why do you say um, that Emmanuel? like give me an example of a scenario where you witness compassion in your environment that has made the difference um well i um i manage a park that's um that straddles um uh, an area affected by armed conflict um and that's been the case since I started, it was the case long before I, I arrived. Um, and it's also an area that is conflicted in so many other ways as well. Um, you, you've got the, these extraordinary natural resources, these extraordinary, um, extraordinarily beautiful and, and valuable landscapes with the most, um, magical wildlife on earth. And around that you have, um, a situation of extreme poverty, yeah. extreme suffering, and enormous vulnerability on 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 the part of of its communities who 
um, also need to access to be able to draw on resources, sometimes in a very destructive way, in order to survive. Um, and they haven't chosen to be in that situation. Um, they um, sometimes need to cut down the, the forest for fuel, for basic domestic fuel, things that we really take for granted. Um, and carving out uh, the, the, the right decisions in um, securing a place for the environment whilst um, acknowledging that need, um, you know, is, is an issue of, mm. of compassion, um, which um, it, it takes a, a lot of, of thought um, to, to, to get it right. Um, and, and we don't always get it right. Um, and if we fail to get it right, then um, I think everything falls apart um, because it becomes an issue of, of deep mm. injustice. Um, and, and when you, um, you know, when you fail to um, acknowledge people's needs, um, then um, you, you, you can provoke, um, a, a, you know, very difficult situations that um, cause harm to people um, and also can, can result in, in, um, in, in, a, in, in a situation of, of extreme violence. And that's really what, what, um, you know, what, what so often happens when, um, um, when the wrong decisions are made. And so, um, I think it's more than, um, it's more than just, a, a, you know, this feeling of compassion. It's actually to do with carving out the right, um, mm. approach to, you know, managing a national park in an area where that national park affects people's lives so much. Um, so, um, I think, I think it is all about values. Um, you know, I think that's, you know, it's, it's fundamental to, um, building a strategy that is acceptable, um, both in terms of the long-term future of a national park, um, and the needs of the people that, that live around it. Um, so it's a, it's a difficult issue. Um, and at the end of the day, if you're not guided, I think by the, those values, you'll, you'll, um, you'll fall short. Just to level set a little bit here, when people think of a park, they don't normally think of people living in it. Uh, that's uh, mm. something that's different and normal there, but maybe for a lot of people, that's not the traditional understanding. When you took over uh, as director, um, was the orientation of the park more around its wildlife and protecting that versus, say, protecting the people in the park? How did you straddle the difference? Well, I've, I've always felt that, um, you know, the wildlife can look after itself. It doesn't need us, um, as such. Um, that's the, um, you know, that's the, the defining character of natural right. ecosystems is that they're natural. You don't, you don't need to intervene except when, um, human activity causes enormous disruption, which is unfortunately has become um, you know, the state of the planet as it were. Um, and then you need to start thinking about how to manage these ecosystems, um, because of, um, human dis um, disturbance. Um, of course in a region like Burunga, it's much more than that because humans are actually into, you know, they're integrally part of that landscape. Um, and so you, you have to consider it, um, not a wild, pristine landscape, but a, a human landscape. Um, and, and so, um, over the years we've, um, realized that more and more that, you know, there's, there's very little chance of the natural environment surviving unless you manage it, um, um, as part of human society, but also to the benefit mm -hmm. of, um, the communities living around the park. Um, and so our, our way of managing Burunga has really, um, been shaped by that. It's gravitated towards actually 
a much more economic, um, economically driven um, strategy than um, the traditional way of managing national parks, which is to, through the biological sciences, through understanding animal populations and so on, um, what, what we've um, um, adopted as a strategy is much more oriented towards the human communities um, and ensuring that this national park um, plays a positive and important role to, to their lives. Um, and so what's come out of that is an effort um, to see how, how we can use um, these natural ecosystems without destroying them, but in a way that will make a significant change to the lives of over 5 million people, most of whom are living under the poverty line, are, are living in extreme poverty um, and under conditions, um, you know, um, tragically, of extreme violence as well. Um, and so this incredible national power, which is Virunga, um, we feel will only survive if it can have a very real impact on improving um, the lives. And by that, I mean the economic conditions of the 5 million people living around it, but also have a very real effect on reducing the levels of, of violence in this region. And um, so those are big challenges um, and they require enormous resources um, and, you know, very ambitious plans. Um, so that's really why, you know, we, we've worked so hard to try and develop um, Virunga, not as just as a national park, but also as um, an engine, a business um, that feeds into the improvement of the lives of people living around it. Um, and that's meant um, creating um, thousands, tens of thousands of jobs um, as a result of this park being well managed um, in that community. Um, to achieve that, um, we need a lot of energy. Um, that meant building um, these hydroelectric plants um, that are enormously expensive, um, but really hold the solution to um, creating mass employment um, around the national park. Um, it's, a, it's a mountainous park with very high rainfall. So the rivers that are flowing out of it are very high in energy. That energy can be converted into electricity. Those electric that electricity is what is needed for businesses to grow. Um, and through that jobs are created. Um, and so that's really the dynamic that we've been trying to create over the years, um, and has actually created quite a remarkable, um, model, um, in and around Burunga. Um, where you start to see a, a symbiosis, as it were, um, uh, a, um, a, a shared benefit between the wildlife and the human communities living around, um, through, um, the, the use of, of these river networks to power industry. Manuel, just to give, uh, um, kind of the scope of the environment that you manage, can you tell us, um, how, how, how big of, how big is Virunga? How many people live in it? Um, uh, how many rangers do you have today that you patrol? Um, how do you do that? I mean, I mean, how, it'd be great to give that sense of the scope of the, of the, of the world that you try to manage and, and, and push in the right direction. So it's, um, yeah, it's become a, um, a huge um, system, Burunga. Um, we, um, we're a national park that stretches over about 300 kilometers. Um, it's, it's bigger than the state of Delaware. Um, but it's also, um, incredibly complex in terms of the natural environment. It goes from over 17,000 feet, um, down to less than 3000 feet. Um, so you have, you know, these incredible diversity of landscapes in between, um, and they're very, you know, they're very difficult to, to, to patrol, to manage. Um, so we have, um, 760 rangers, um, men and women who 
um, whose who's, um, lives are um, committed to protecting those those incredible landscapes. Um, and um, but around that, we also have um, a huge team of um, professionals, mainly um, you know the vast majority of whom are young Congolese professionals who work in all sorts of sectors, tourism, um, there's civil engineers, electromechanical engineers, um, work, um, people working in industry, in agriculture, and so on, whose job it is to turn those ecosystems um, without damaging them um, into um, assets that enable the region to rebuild its economy. Um, and so there we have about 3,000 people all together um, working in those sectors um, in a whole number of, um, you know, what we would call social enterprises, so businesses um, that are commercially driven, um, but for which all, all the dividends, all the profits are reinvested into either social development or, um, or, um, or conservation. Um, and that's really the you know, the power, the powerhouse behind, um, both the, you know, the survival of the national park, but also, um, you know, the, um, the growth, the economic growth of the, of the community living and around it. How many it. people just live in the park total? So, um, there aren't that many people living in the park because it's a national it park. Is. So it's, it's integrally protected and there are communities living around this huge lake in the middle of the park and they're fishing right. communities. Um, and then there are, um, you know, there are people who enter the park, um, illegally as well, including right. these, these right. militia groups. Um, and, um, you know, they're, um, unfortunately more than more often than we would wish. Um, but the most important, um, of course, is, is the people living around the park. So. Within a day's walk of the park boundary, um, there are about 5 million people. Um, and that includes the majority who are rural communities who subside off, off you know, off the land, the farm, farming communities. Um, but there are also these big cities like the city of Goma, which has, um, you know, close to 2 million people and the city of Butembo in the north, which has you know, not far off 1 million people. Um, so all of that adds up to, you know, an incredibly, um, diverse, vast, rich community living around the park. What would you say, Manuel, since taking over was, uh, one of the more character defining moments for you as the director of the park? Uh, um, well, I think the very first day was, was, um, you know, was tough, you know, I was sworn in in Goma and then within 10 minutes, um, of being, um, formally nominated as part director, I was called in to, um, rescue, um, a, um, a, a baby gorilla that was being trafficked, um, in the city of Goma, it turned out to be held by a senior army officer. And so we. Um, you know, we, we came into his compound, not realizing he was a senior army officer, um, with a group of Rangers and being surrounded by, um, 50 or 60, um, military so personnel. Did your Rangers have guns? That happy to see did your, us. Did your Sorry? Rangers have guns when you walked in there? Um, well, Rangers are always, yeah. um, they're always armed. That's part of their, their job. Um, I think the problem was, you know, the, the, the director was probably a bit naive, um, about what, you know, what can be achieved in a situation like that, but we managed to, you know, to talk our way out of it. And that's, that's really how you, you handle most of these situations. And we recovered, um, the, the, you know, the. Um, the, um, this poor animal, which turned out to be not a gorilla, but a chimpanzee. Um, and, and so that was our, that was my first day on the job. And it's really been like that ever since, you know, you, you can't quite predict what's going to happen that day, but it's generally it's each day is, is, you know, has its, um, has its surprises. Um, and, and you just learn to, 
Milan to adapt. Well, I mean, uh, the average business folk, they consider their enemy sometimes, I guess, maybe their competition. Well, in your case, in your work environment, you literally have rolling bands of militia with military, uh, strong military capabilities, uh, actively attacking the rangers in the park. Um, and it's been that case, it's been the case ever since you took over. When did the militias first start showing up? Uh, so the, I mean, the, you know, the event that, um, led to me being nominated was the, um, you know, this, this terrible massacre that happened of the mountain gorillas, um, in 2007, right. um, I was working in the park and that was really, um, re really captured, um, the story of why this region has been so badly affected by, um, by militias and by, you know, um, the armed conflict that results from their, their presence. Um, and, and, you know, what, um, the, the story that lies behind that is that, um, you know, we were, we were in the forest at the time I was working on the mountain gorillas and, you know, one evening we heard a whole series of, um, of gunshots in the forest. Um, and the next day we went in with some, some rangers and we, we fell upon this horrific scene of, um, five mountain gorillas, one male and, and four females, um, that had been, um, you could say, um, summarily executed and they'd been shot, um, multiple times, um, close up. Um, but what was really strange was that the baby gorillas were not taken and they weren't killed for their meat. There was no obvious reason why these um, gorillas had been killed. And it took us about a year of investigation to really understand that there was actually this wide, very wide reaching um, crime network to do with the trafficking, not of the gorillas, but of their habitat and um, the cutting down of mm -hmm. trees for fuel wood for charcoal. And um, that kind of involved not just the militias, but also, um, state authorities, communities, um, even, um, members of the park service themselves who were involved in the trafficking in order to make money. Um, and because a great many of the rangers were protecting the gorillas, um, and they you know, as a consequence, they were protecting the forest. Um, because it was necessary for the, the, the gorilla's survival, um, the militias decided to kill the gorillas. Um, and because the situation had become so catastrophic, you know, we were losing the one species that we were required to be protecting. Um, it, it really created this, um, reflection on the part of the government authorities on you know, on the fact that very serious change was needed. Um, and so my predecessor, who was actually arrested for involvement in the charcoal trade, um, was, um, dismissed as a park warden. Um, and they, um, you know, they, you know, um, um, expressed a need to try a whole new approach to protecting right. Runga National Park, and that's really why we came in. But it's integrally tied to this long history of um, militia presence, um, which is not an easy thing to explain. Um, you know, it's really tied into the whole functioning of the economy, the whole functioning of society, the history of the region. Um, and it's really tied to these natural resources. Um, you know, they're because, um, you know, the you know, the, 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 there is so much poverty, there is so much need. And because the resources are so plentiful and rich in Congo, um, it's easy pickings for militia groups, for people who want to act outside the law. Um, and that goes back many decades. Um, it's not something that's new. Um, and unfortunately the park's really right at the center of that. Um, so, you know, your question is, um, you know, how, how do the, yeah, how, how far back do the militias go and how do they fit into all of this? Well, it's really to do with that. It's to do with using, you know, being in, 
you know, the, one, one of the poorest um, societies on earth in terms of material wealth, um, you know, people living in, in such extreme poverty, um, surrounded by such incredibly rich resources. Yeah. Um, and that invariably creates um, enormous problems um, in terms of um, you know, the breakdown of the rule of law and the increase in violence. Well, as I'm sitting here talking to Emmanuel, um, the, the light is, is fading because he is in a tent. I think as uh, you're in a tent, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're in a tent. Um, uh, it's getting dark <laughs> in Eastern Congo. And I'm, By the way, how many years yeah. did you live in a tent for? Or uh, have you lived in a tent for all um, the years you've lived in Congo? Or? So I, I, yeah, I have a, I have a tent that's behind me. And then um, here I'm sitting on a, um, a veranda where I have a, um, a table and and some very comfortable chairs. But, but, I, but I, 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 how many um, years have you lived I, in I actually tent? live very well here. <laughs> um, since uh, two thousand and nine. So since we really were able, two thousand and eight. Yeah, when we were able to come back to the park. Yeah. Um, after the war. And, uh, and uh, we... for, for the listeners, I've been to the Virunga National Park, and Emmanuel has created a five star um, tourist. A destination with uh, bungalows in the middle of the jungle amongst monkeys and some of the most beautiful uh, location you could ever want to have a hotel room. But uh, he didn't build anything for himself. He built, uh, he kept the tent. Uh, uh, it still lives in the tent, I think, with, uh, along with a lot of his men. Uh, most of your men probably live in tents, right? Yeah, that's most of them do. Um, and that's part of the life of, of being a ranger in, 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 um, in Congo. Um, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, when, when you come down, you get to stay at the lodge. Right, right. Um, <laughs> and that's how, that's how it is. Like, life is like that. It's not always, uh, yeah. equal or fair. For, uh, <laughs> for those who don't know it, um, uh, Virunga National Park is one of the most extraordinary lodges, uh, but unfortunately it's closed right now due to the violence that's uh, been occurring uh, in Eastern Congo and around the park. Um, Emmanuel, can you speak a little bit about um, how many rangers you've lost um, since you've been the park director? Um, and maybe can you recall the first time you lost a ranger uh, or, or when, you know, and how you, how that affected you? Um, I remember it very well. And the first ranger that we lost was, was uh, Germain, who was working um, on Mount Chaburimu, which is where the, the lowland gorillas are. Um, and, um, there was a militia group that attacked his position. Um, two two rangers were badly injured. Um, um, one of them survived, and we um, tragically died. Um, and um, I think that happened about four months after I first I was first appointed. Um, um, since then. You know, we've lost over a hundred of our staff mm -hmm. in, in that way. Um, and so we, um, I think we, you know, we've had, um, an incredibly, very, you know, incredibly difficult, um, series of, um, of very violent attacks, um, that, that regularly occur. Um, you know, last year was, was particularly difficult, um, as was the year before, so it hasn't it hasn't, it hasn't become easier at all. Um, and it, it never does. Um, and, and, you know, we, most, most of our efforts are, um, are, you know, aimed at trying to do the work, um, without putting our, our staff, um, um, in, in such, um, danger and it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really, really difficult. Um, and, and we haven't, we haven't found the, you know, the solution to that problem. Um, but you know, the work still has to be done. 
And so that, that makes, you know, that, that makes this, you know, this job, um, you know, more, much more difficult than I, than I would wish. Well, what's interesting to me is that it, it, you live and work along with everybody in the Garunga National Park in a perpetual state of, um, of crisis in many ways, because you live in a war zone essentially, and you work in the war zone and you're trying to protect the assets in a war zone, essentially. And the, uh, the day to day, uh, the, you know, most people kind of, I think, even if you're a soldier in war, you hope the war would end, uh, or you think it might end in a few, in a few years. And in your case, um, uh, it just seems to perpetuate itself. Uh, when you solve one problem, another problem pops up. Um, how have you personally managed to keep your head up um, in the midst of what is, I mean, the very definition of discouraging circumstances? Um, how do you, it, it in the face of of just little, literally life and death. Um, problems and circumstances and consequences and uh in scenarios where you really don't see a lot of hope other than just to show up the next day i would imagine at times um how do you how do you keep your spirits up or, or maybe you don't or how do you manage when you're discouraged yeah um i mean yeah we, we've um we've had a you know a run of of um difficult situations so you know we've, we've had um three civil wars the current one is still ongoing um since um since we started in, in 2008 um we've had you know the ebola epidemic the second worst ebola epidemic in history that um occurred in and around the national park um three years ago um there was, uh, you know, a very, very significant volcanic eruption that destroyed a lot of our infrastructure, you know, the energy infrastructure that we'd built up, um, and, um, um, and, and, and so on. Um, so it just, yeah, like you say, it just, it just keeps on coming. Um, what makes it, you know, perhaps not as bad as it may look is the fact that um, you have such an extraordinary team to work with. Um, so, you know, you're, you're, you wake up one morning and, and, and you're confronted with, um, you know, the outbreak of violence that, you know, develops into, um, uh, a civil war. Um, and you have people who are incredibly experienced, um, and incredibly committed around you, um, that help you work through those problems. Um, when they're problems that you haven't created, um, you can, you can go at it with a certain peace of mind that you just do the best you can and draw heavily on those people around you that, um, are just there, um, to help. Um, and it's, you know, it's all over their faces. Um, so that does make it an awful lot easier um, than it may seem. Um, and so I think, you know, the one, um, sort of management quality, um, that somebody holding a position like this, you know, has to have above all else is to be able to recognize, um, the quality in others and, and make the most of it. Um, and I think, you know, I, you know, I, I've always known that I'm not, you know, by any stretch, um, um, the best of managers, but I know how to, how to, um, 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 find and, you know, nurture, um, those qualities in others. Um, and, um, and that's really what's kept me going is, you know, acknowledging that I'm, I fall short in so many ways. And so I have to, um, um, draw on the the strengths of others to be able to 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 do this work, and that does make it a hell of a lot easier than 
um, than it, it may seem. How important is it to you and your staff or for you to find people with character? And, and is it difficult? Um, how would you define its, its relative importance in the way in which you manage the park? Um, I mean, it's difficult at times. You know, it can be difficult to um, draw people to, you know, a region of the world that is, you know, that, that um, you know, that may be frightening to, to, to others if you're trying to recruit people um, you know, from across the world, but, um, fortunately we, you know, we do have, um, incredibly talented, um, hardworking, um, creative minds here in Congo. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I, um, I, 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 every day I feel amazed at how capable and, and, um, effective, you know, they are. Um, and, you know, I think they, they feel very committed to this park and right. to this, um, to this idea that, that is, that is Virunga. Um, so probably it's not as, you know, it's not, it's not as hard as, um, I had feared when I started, you know, it, Virunga has this amazing ability to draw, um, fantastic people to it yes. and, and they're, you know, they, you know, they end up staying and, and remaining very committed for a very long time. Yeah. And um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually, it's actually pretty good. You know, when I asked you what your biggest character defining moment, um, I have to confess here. I thought it would be when you got shot, maybe would be the, uh, or, or the ambush, uh, and you, you, you had to somehow get home to safety uh that was not a character defining moment Emmanuel. no definitely day. not <laughs> it certainly wasn't i because when you're um if you get shot in the stomach and in the chest you're pretty incapacitated on the whole and so you you um you're completely dependent on others um and you know i had a um, I was, I was lucky, you know, there were two young men from a nearby village who came into the forest and picked me up and put me on the back of a motorbike. Um, and I, I was driven to hospital. Um, and then I was looked after by, um, an incredible, um, team of Congolese medics. Um, and then I had, you know, my team around me almost immediately. So, you know, all the all the, the display of character was really shown by them. I was <laughs> not very, I wasn't very, uh, I wasn't very active during that period. But, uh, but um, to be fair, I mean, uh, Emmanuel was ambushed by some militia group while he was driving back to the room to park by himself. Uh, and I have a rumor that uh, while the doctors were working on you, there was a problem with the translation and you were having to translate uh, for, for the doctor, is that, is that, is that just a rumor of, of the fearless <laughs> and extraordinary Emmanuel or what, what, what happened there while you were trying to be worked on? Um, well, I had, um, I had, uh, a team of Congolese doctors and then the UN, um, uh, force at the time sent a couple of, um, um, uh, medics who were Indian nationals. Um, but unfortunately they couldn't speak French and the Congolese medics couldn't speak English. Um, but I, I, so I think I was the only one in the room who could speak both languages. And so I, I tried to make myself useful, <laughs> but I don't know how helpful it was <laughs> when you're being operated up. Um, it probably came out as a bit of a gurgling sound, but yeah, there you go. Well, Emmanuel, um. You're one of my favorites, and um, and I'm just so grateful to have the chance to talk and share my well, little bit of you with everybody you're else. You're spending some of that time with us, Dan, was uh, um, a, a, a significant part of the enjoyment I've really got out of these these many years in Barucca. Well, we hope to. I hope to to continue to come and to bring my children and, and to enjoy. Uh, 
our relationship. And, um, but most of all, I want you to stay safe. Um, and, and I'm, I'm just so grateful for who you are. Um, you're one of the most extraordinary men of character I've ever had the privilege of knowing. And, uh, and thank you for, for showing up every day in Virunga. Um, thank you, Dan. It's always good. It's always wonderful to spend time with you. And, and if anybody wants to know how to learn more about Virunga National Park, can you, can you direct folks to the best way to do that? Um, yeah, certainly. Um, you know, there's the, there's the park's website, which is, uh, virunga.org, um, which, um, can also send you to all sorts of other resources about the park. Um, there's an awful lot on the internet now. Um, there's also the Netflix movie, um, that came out a few years ago, um, that tells a part of our story. Um, and, um, quite called? a lot. Yeah. Virunga? The film? It's just called Virunga. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, and so, yeah, that, that'll, that'll keep you busy for a while. Well, and I will add also that, um, you know, for any of those that are interested in finding ways to support, uh, the park and the rangers and, uh, all those that are constantly showing up, um, you know, reach out to Manuel directly through the, through the, the website. Um, yeah, he, um. He he's always downplays what he needs, and I think he needs a lot to be able to do what he does every day. Um, so for those that maybe possibly gets inspired by this discussion, uh, dive in and help. And um, thanks again, mate. You're black now, so so yeah. I know, I know. The, 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 the sun the sun sets very quickly in the in the tropics. Yes, yes. Um, and we also have a thunderstorm that's just started. So oh. Um, yeah, well, I appreciate you kind of orchestrating all that to make the uh, our time together all the more dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Bye bye.